Why did God become a man? It says, Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. Ah, the gift of youth. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth, with its top reaching the heaven, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it, notice these words, there above it all stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you're lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your seed. I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely... The Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. Now turn over to John chapter 1 with me, if you would. And let's finish our reading. John chapter 1, going to read in verse 43. Uh, this is the story of the calling of Jesus' first disciples, and it culminates in the calling of a disciple named Nathaniel. John chapter 1, beginning in verse 43. It says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree before your, Philip, before your brother Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. Then he added, Truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come minister to us. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your beautiful presence here. Father, thank you for these people you love so much and for your powerful word. I pray, Lord, that we would encounter you today through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen, amen. and amen. In the 11th century, St. Anselm of Canterbury asked the question, why did God become a man? It's a question so big that it's actually answered several different ways in the words of Jesus and in the New Testament. During this Christmas season, we're exploring this question together, why did God become a man? And my prayer is that your heart will overflow with awe and with adoration, with gratitude, with faith as we look at the most basic doctrine of our Christian faith the doctrine of the Incarnation. Starting in Hebrews chapter 2 last week, we saw that God became a man to cry with us. Looking in John 1 today, we discover that God became a man to bring heaven down to earth. John 1 tells the story of the Incarnation from heaven's perspective. In the beginning, the word always was wasing. The word always was face to face with God, and the word always was God. And then at a particular moment in human history, the word became something that he previously was not. The word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. God became one of us. 
God moved into our neighborhood. In Hebrews 2, we saw that Jesus was made like us in every way. Without ceasing to be God in any regard, God became a man. St. Paul says that this is indeed a great mystery. It falls into that category of things in the Bible that is just too wonderful for us. At the end of John 1, Jesus says that he is the ladder from Jacob's dream that connects heaven and earth. The bottom of the ladder that touches the earth represents his humanity. The top of the ladder that touches heaven represents his deity. Jesus, the unique God-man, spans the gap between heaven and earth. He bridges the divide between God and us. He closes the breach. As our great high priest, he lifts up our earthly needs to the Father and he brings down the realities and the resources of heaven to us here on earth. That last line is the one that I want to camp out on for a few minutes this morning. Why did God become a man? To bring heaven down to earth. To bring the realities and the resources of heaven down into our earthly existence and into our personal experience. Paul said it this way, you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. What's Paul saying? He's saying that Jesus left the riches of his heavenly existence and he entered into the poverty of our earthly existence, extreme poverty at that. And he did it in order that we might enter into the riches of heavenly existence even while we're still right here on the earth. What did Jesus teach us to pray? You know it, let your kingdom Come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does that mean? What is this heaven on earth brought about by the incarnation of Jesus Christ? I want to share five things with you quickly this morning. And if you're worshiping with us for the first time, I can guarantee my quickly is not your quickly. But it's all right. Jesus is going to help us and we'll get through it. What is the heaven on earth brought about by the incarnation? First this. Heaven on earth is being connected to God in Jesus. John chapter 1 links the incarnation to the calling of the first disciples. Andrew and his brother, Simon Peter, an unnamed disciple who is most certainly John the Beloved, the author of this gospel, and Philip and his brother, Nathaniel. It culminates in Jesus' pronouncement that they will see heaven opened up and Jesus will become Jacob's ladder connecting heaven and earth. What is heaven on earth? Heaven on earth is to be personally known by God, and to know him personally. Each one of the disciples that Jesus called in John 1 was unique. And Jesus approached each one uniquely. Jesus knew what each one of them was like, and he knew it before they knew him. He is a very personal God and a very personable Savior. That's a good tweetable line right there. The climax is Jesus' encounter with Nathanael. When he sees Nathanael, he says, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no guile, no deceit. Jesus is actually making a little pun here. In Genesis chapter 27, that word guile is used to describe the character of Jacob, whose name was, of course, changed to Israel. So Jesus is saying here, Here is an Israelite in whom there is no Jacob. Nathaniel said, how do you know me? And then Jesus really read his mail and he said, Nathaniel, I saw you while you were sitting under the fig tree before your brother called you. We can't be exactly sure what Nathaniel was doing under the fig tree, but we do have some clues. 
In Jesus' day, it was popular to pray and study and meditate on the scriptures under the shade of fig trees. We can be fairly certain that Nathaniel was doing something spiritually significant. In fact, it's likely that he was reading and meditating on the life of Jacob from Genesis chapter 27 and 28. What we can be sure about is that Jesus knew Nathaniel's character and he knew Nathaniel's conduct. He knew Nathaniel's thoughts and he knew Nathaniel's deeds. He knew Nathaniel's ponderings and he knew Nathaniel's whereabouts and he knows ours too. Jesus knew that Peter was impetuous before Peter knew Jesus. He knew that Philip was shy before Philip knew Jesus. He knew the relationship status of the woman at the well even without Facebook. He knew that his friend Lazarus had passed away from far away. He knew the self-righteous thoughts of his dinner host, Simon. He knew the evil thoughts of the Pharisees and the competitive thoughts of the disciples. It really is true what Jesus said. He knows the very number of hairs on your head. He knows what you need before you even ask him. He knows when even a single sparrow falls to the ground and you are much more valuable to him than many sparrows. It really is true what Paul said. He is not far from any one of us. Heaven on earth begins that moment that you know that God knows you like that. That's what happened to Nathaniel. When Jesus recognized Nathaniel, Nathaniel recognized Jesus. He immediately addresses Jesus by two messianic terms linked in the Old Testament. Son of God, King of Israel. Nathaniel was personally known to God and in that moment he came to know God personally. And Jesus said to him, if you're blown away by that, Nathaniel, just fasten your seatbelt. You ain't seen nothing yet. You're about to see more of heaven on earth. What is heaven on earth? It's personal encounters with him. I love this. Jesus' very first words in the gospel of John are, what are you looking for? In fact, Andrew and Peter and John and Philip and Nathaniel, they were looking for something. They were spiritually hungry and thirsty. They were longing for revival in Israel. Anybody like to see a little revival around here in America? <laughs> they were longing to be restored to right relationship with God. That's why they were hanging around with John the Baptist in John chapter 1. They loved the repentance and they loved the spiritual renewal that was happening in his ministry. They were looking for someone. They were looking for the Messiah. When Jesus walked by and John the Baptist said, there's the one, Andrew and John immediately followed Jesus. Andrew ran and told his brother Peter, we found the Messiah. Philip ran and told his brother Nathaniel, this is the one, the prophet, this is the prophet that Moses foretold in the book of Deuteronomy. It's evident that they had studied and that they had discussed the messianic scriptures together. Their hearts were hungry. It's evident that Nathaniel was well acquainted with the messianic scriptures. He studied them well, sitting under his fig tree. His heart was hungry. Like old Simeon and Anna, he wanted to see the Messiah. I love Jesus' next words. Come and see. When Nathanael objected that nothing good could possibly come from Nazareth, Philip said to him, Nathanael, just come and see. Heaven on earth begins in that moment when you actually see what you never were able to find by studying religion. Heaven on earth is when your deep spiritual meditations are replaced by an actual encounter with Jesus. Heaven on earth is when your spiritual ponderings are replaced by the wonder of his living presence. It's when your study of theology is replaced by a personal theophany. It's when your carefully constructed objections to Jesus crumble in his presence. When Jacob dreamed about a ladder connecting heaven and earth, it was Jacob's first encounter with God too. 
He knew all about the religious experiences of his grandfather Abraham and his father Isaac. But this was the first time that Jacob experienced God personally and it rocked his world. And so it was for Nathaniel. Meeting Jesus rocked his world and Jesus said to him, you ain't seen nothing yet. Jesus said to him, you will see heaven opened. Two things there. First of all, that word opened, it is the word that is used specifically for the opening of blind eyes. A different word is used to talk about the opening of a door. This is the opening of blind eyes. And so the seeing that Jesus is talking about is not a physical seeing, but it is a spiritual seeing. What it means is you will experience things that you have never experienced before, heavenly things. Second, that word opened is in a tense that means it is permanently opened. It has been opened and it will stay opened. It has been opened and no man can shut it. Jacob's dream faded in the morning mist, but Jesus has permanently opened the door to heaven. That means that our experience in him is not open and shut. It's not on and off. In Jesus, we continually experience God's presence. In Jesus, we are continually aware of the fact that he knows us personally and that we know him. That, beloved, is heaven on earth. What is the heaven on earth brought about by the incarnation? It's a connection to God. Second, heaven on earth is a new identity in Jesus. The truth that God knows us personally is wonderful in itself. But even more wonderful is the truth that God doesn't leave us the way he knows we are. He makes us something better. Someone once said, well, God loves me just the way I am. Yes, it's true, but God also loves you too much to leave you the way that you are. God has good plans to make you into something better. God has a new name and a new identity to give you. When Jesus met Simon in John 1, he spoke a new identity over him. He said, you are Simon, son of John, but now you will be called Peter, a rock. Jesus was saying that he was going to effect a transformation in the character of Peter. Rather than the impetuous blurting out man that he was, Jesus transformed Peter into a steady, wise, gracious, judicious man. Jacob received a new identity too. Beginning with his dream at Bethel, God started a work in Jacob's character that culminated at a brook called Jabbok, which means the place of emptying. At Jabbok, God changed Jacob's name from deceiver to Israel, a prince with God. At the place of emptying, God transformed Jacob into a true Israelite in whom there is no Jacob. Beloved, God has a new name waiting in heaven for you. It says that he's going to hand it to you when you get to the top of that ladder. And right now he is in the process of emptying Jacob out of you and giving you a new identity here on earth. Your new identity means a new direction and a new destination. In the Bible, a name not only indicated someone's character, it indicated someone's destiny. When God changed Abraham and Sarah's name, they received a new direction and a new destiny. When Jacob received a new name from God, he received a new direction and a new destiny. We would be remiss if we failed to remember that Jacob's dream happened during the worst crisis of his life. He stole his brother's birthright through deceit, and now he was running for his life. Just when everything in his life was in complete chaos and in complete disorder, just when he had made a royal mess of everything, when he was alone and when he was afraid, God came and stood directly above him. And into Jacob's disorder came the ladder of God's holy order with the angels ascending and descending in perfect rhythm in obedience to the voice of God. 
You see, that is heaven on earth when in the midst of complete chaos, God comes and he stands directly over you. He stands over your marriage. He stands over your kids. When the ladder of his holy order comes and moves into the midst of your disorder. Your new identity means you're part of a new family. Hebrews 2 says that you have become one of Abraham's descendants by faith. Physically, you might not be Jewish by birth. Some of you are. Most of us are not. But whether we are Jewish by birth, we are all part of the spiritual lineage of Abraham. Jesus said to Nathanael, here is a true Israelite in which there is no Jacob. It doesn't matter whether physically you're Jewish or not because you are part of the lineage of Abraham by faith. Your new identity means that you're now set free from the generational iniquity that has traveled down your family lines. The grip of addiction that has traveled down your family line from one generation to the next is now broken off of you and off of your children because you belong to a new family now. Yeah. Depression, anxiety, phobias, obsessive compulsive disorders, mental and emotional illnesses that have traveled down your family line from one generation to the next are now broken off of you and your children because you belong to a new family now. Sexual sin and anger and abuse and deceit is now broken off of you and your children. The Lord said to me while we were worshiping the word kleptomania. If kleptomania is in your family, I want to tell you in Jesus you belong to a new family now. And it is broken off of you and it is broken off your children in the name of Jesus. Listen to me. Generational poverty is broken off of you and it's broken off of your family line. The old covenant says the sins of the fathers are visited on the children to the third and the fourth generation. But Peter, the man who was once called Simon, but was changed into a rock by Jesus, wrote that in the new covenant, by the precious blood of Jesus, we have been redeemed. We have been delivered. We have been set free from the empty way of life that was handed down to us by our fathers. You have a new name, a new family, a new destination, a new direction. Your identity also means you have a new citizenship. Your destination is the top of that ladder. You're moving on up to the sky. Your destination is heaven and your citizenship is there. You belong to the kingdom of heaven now. You're just visiting here. You're just passing through. Your home is a city whose foundations are not laid with human hands, but whose builder and maker is God. Your home is the Jerusalem that is above, and you are free in it. What is heaven on earth brought about the incarnation? It's a connection to God. It's a new identity. Third, this one's my favorite. <laughs> heaven on earth is being God's landing place on earth. <clears throat> Jacob didn't realize the significance of his dream. When he awoke, he said, how awesome is this place? The Lord is here and I didn't know it. This is Bethel. Bethel means the house of God. Beth is house, El is God. This is the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Now to be sure, places were important in the Old Testament. They still are. Bethel was a significant place in Israel's history. But I want to tell you that the dream meant something far more than Jacob initially realized. God did not make promises to a place. God made promises to a person. God promised Jacob that the realities and the resources of heaven would accompany him wherever he went. God promised Jacob his presence. Jacob I will go with you. He promised Jacob his protection. 
I will watch over you wherever you go. He promised divine guidance. I will bring you back to this land. He promised Jacob dominion in the land. He promised him fruitfulness. He promised him a lasting legacy. God promised Jacob that he would bring to the completion the process that he began in the dream. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I promised you. Beloved, listen to me. God's ladder did not remain in Bethel. It went wherever Jacob went. When Jacob went to Uncle Laban's, the ladder went to Uncle Laban's. The ladder of God's blessing stayed fixed over his life. Even when Uncle Laban cheated him again and again over 20 years, playing a switcheroo with his bride and then changing his pay, lowering his pay 10 times. And yet nothing could stop the blessing of God from overtaking Jacob because the ladder went with him to Uncle Laban's house. When Jacob fled to the hill country of Gilead, the, lad the ladder went with him. When he went to meet his brother Esau at Shechem, the ladder went with him. When he went to Egypt to escape a famine, the ladder went with him. God's landing place, God's point of contact on the earth was not a place, but it was a person. And so it is with us. Jesus, the incarnate son, is the ladder that connects heaven and earth and we are the landing place. We are the location on earth where the ladder rests. We are the point of contact on the earth. And every good thing that comes down that ladder comes down on us. Every good gift, every blessing, every heavenly provision that comes down that ladder comes down and it lands where we are, where we live, where we work, where we relax, where we worship. We are the Bethel of God on earth. We are the gateway to heaven on earth and Jesus is the ladder. All the heavenly order and authority that is the top of that ladder is positioned over us and it comes down that ladder and it lands where we are. That's good preaching right there. What does it mean that we're God's landing place? It means that God sends down signs and wonders and miracles where we are. Back in Hebrews, it says that Jesus' incarnation marked the beginning of a new season in human history. Hebrews calls it the last days, the age to come, the time of salvation. And Hebrews chapter 2 verse 4 says that God confirms the arrival of this new season on earth with signs and wonders and miracles. Jesus announced that the kingdom of heaven had arrived. The first word of his gospel was repent because the kingdom of heaven has come down to you. He said specifically that his demonstration of supernatural power brought the kingdom of heaven down to earth. He said, if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then surely the kingdom of heaven has come down to you. And then he sent his disciples out with the same commission, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, deliver the demon oppressed, and tell them that the kingdom of heaven has come down to them. Heaven on earth is when God sends healing for sick bodies down the ladder and it lands where we are. Heaven on earth is when healing for injuries come down the ladder. Heaven on earth is when healing for birth defects come down the ladder. It's when healing for degenerative conditions comes down the ladder. It's when healing, listen to me, for terminal illnesses comes down the ladder. It's when healing for cancer comes down the ladder creative miracles that place or replace something in the body that is missing comes down the ladder. Miracles of provision come down the ladder. Miracles of protection come down the ladder. This is for someone specifically. Miracles of a human roadblock being moved out of your way comes down the ladder and it lands where you are. What does it mean that we're God's landing place? It means that God sends down gifts of the Holy Spirit where we are. 
In addition to signs and wonders and miracles, Hebrews 2.4 says that in this new season of human history, God confirms it through gifts of the Holy Spirit that he distributes as he wills. Heaven on earth is when a word of knowledge comes down the ladder like the one that Jesus gave to Nathaniel. I saw you while you were sitting under your fig tree. When God reveals the very whispers of your heart to the mind of another believer and that person speaks them back to you under the anointing of the Holy Spirit and in that moment you know that you know that God knows you, that he knows where you're at and that he knows what you need. Heaven on earth is when a word of wisdom comes down the ladder, giving you heavenly direction. It's when a word of prophecy comes down the ladder and lets you know that where you are today is not where you're going to finish, that what you are today is not yet what you're going to be. It has not yet appeared what you're going to be. When you see Jesus, you're going to be like him. Heaven on earth is a message in tongues, an interpretation that comes down the ladder and encourages the church. Heaven on earth is when a burst of faith comes barreling down the ladder and it gives you the ability to believe in the moment of your worst crisis that God is going to get you through. Anybody use a little shot of faith coming down the ladder for you today just to let you know that God's going to bring it through? Paul said that the gifts of the Holy Spirit coming down the ladder create precisely the same effect as Jacob's dream. He says that if a newcomer comes in and he sees the gifts coming down the ladder, he's going to exclaim, just like Jacob, just like Nathaniel, surely God is in this place. What does it mean that we're God's landing place? means that God dispatches angels where we are. Don't have time to talk about the role of angels, but suffice to say that angels are the means by which blessings from heaven are conveyed to us. Hebrews says that angels are messengers dispatched by God to bring aid to we who are believers in Jesus Christ. Jesus said that heaven on earth is that even the least believer in the kingdom of heaven, even the most wobbly, even the most unfaithful, even the most uncertain believer in the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, has angels assigned to him who are constantly watching the face of God, waiting for instructions. Angels ascend and they descend. Angels carry our prayer requests. They carry our needs up to the Father, and then they come back down bringing answers from heaven. Angels come down the ladder with messages from God. Angels come down the ladder bringing gifts of healing from God. They come down the ladder and they surround us and they protect us. They come around the ladder to comfort us. They come and bring gifts of provision. You know, there were a couple of occasions where angels came and ministered to Jesus in an hour of need. And I suppose if the Son of God could use the assistance of angels on earth, that we could use the assistance of angels now and then too. What does it mean that we're God's landing place? It means that the blessings that come down the ladder are not for us alone. They come down where we are, but they're not for us alone. God's promise to Jacob was all the people of the earth will be blessed in you and your seed. That was a messianic promise. The seed of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is Jesus, Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. But the point of being God's landing place is so that others can come and see. There are more disciples out there yet to be discovered. There are more disciples out there who are just waiting to learn that God knows them very personally. There are more disciples out there who are, have yet to have their religious searching eclipsed by an actual encounter with Jesus. There are more disciples out there who have yet to receive a word of knowledge that makes them exclaim, surely God is in this place. What is heaven on earth brought about by the incarnation? Connection with God, a new identity, being God's landing place. Number four, heaven on earth is spoiling the strong man's house. Don't have time to elaborate, but Jesus refers to himself here by his favorite title, the Son of Man. Nathaniel, 
I'm telling you, you haven't seen anything yet. Truly, I tell you, you're going to see with your spiritual eyes heaven permanently opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on me, the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title that Jesus took from Daniel chapter 7 that foretells the Messiah's absolute authority on earth. Daniel said, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming down to earth in the clouds of heaven. And the ancient of days, that's God, gave him authority and glory and sovereign power. His dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom shall not pass away. Heaven on earth is when God comes and he stands directly over you and his authority and his dominion travel down the ladder and take over the atmosphere where you are. See, when that happens, the enemy, Satan, is stripped of his authority. Satan and his demons, they're immobilized, they're neutralized, they are overcome by a stronger power. Jesus called it spoiling the strong man's house. When God stands directly over a place that has been a stronghold of the enemy and his authority and his dominion travel down that ladder, the strong man in that place is tied up and the prisoners in his house are set free. I tell you, you in the name of Jesus. God is coming to stand over you. He's coming to stand over your house. He's coming to stand over your place of business. He's coming to stand over your relationships and his authority and his dominion are coming down to change the atmosphere where you are. What is heaven on earth brought about by the incarnation? The final thing is this. Heaven on earth is living in the hope of glory in Jesus. Worship team, you can come help me. Heaven on earth is living in the hope of glory in Jesus. Heaven on earth is the hope that we have in Jesus Christ for this life and for the next life. Jacob dreamed a dream about a ladder connecting heaven and earth. And from the top of that ladder, God spoke to him and he promised him I will not leave you until I have done everything that I promised you. Beloved, listen to me. Heaven on earth is the promise that your life will count for something. Your life will not fail to have significance. Your life of faith in God is not for nothing. Your life will not end in disgrace but your life will end in heavenly victory. Heaven on earth is the promise that I will not leave you until there is no Jacob left in you. Heaven on earth is the promise I will not leave you until all the chaos in your life comes into heavenly order under my authority. Heaven on earth is the promise I will not leave you until you have dominion over all that is around you in your home, in your workplace, at school, wherever you are. Heaven on earth is the promise I will not leave you until you are abundantly fruitful. I will not leave you until you receive the double portion of your birthright. I will not leave you until you come into the fullness of your inheritance. I will Will not leave you until your life grows to be a big beautiful blessing to many many people the ladder is fixed in place over you and wherever you go it's going with you it's going to stay with you until your journey is through heaven on earth is the promise that we are permanently connected to what's at the top of the ladder to who is at the top of the ladder and that is our final destination. Why did God become a man? To bring heaven down to earth. To connect us with God. To give us a new identity. To make us God's landing place on earth. To spoil the strong man. And so that we can live in the hope of glory. 
Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, a great big praise in this place today? Oh, come on. Let's give Jesus a great big praise.